What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another off-season edition of the podcast. I'm Ben Hover, joined as I always am by Joey Carrion. And on today's show, we're going to cover another batch of NFL news. A decent bit has happened since the last time we recorded more NFL free agency signings, win totals up across the league, across the books for the 2023 season, best ball season in full swing. Got a lot to talk about, Joey. How you doing? I noticed you have a, a new background for those catching the video. <laughs> yeah, new background, uh, new place of living. So shout out to me. A lot has happened since we recorded the last podcast, for sure. Free agency has kind of died down. Um, mm -hmm. There's not many signings happening at this current moment. We still have some news about certain players that we will get into, uh, for sure. But definitely the last talk of free agency from us and then we'll move on to you know the nfl draft which is this month more best ball content we haven't done any to start this year so far so we'll definitely get into that for sure but before that i mean if you're watching on youtube make sure you subscribe to the channel helps us out a ton uh, make sure you leave a like on the video that also helps uh, us reach new viewers so we appreciate it if you're watching on youtube and if you're listening to this podcast just subscribe to the podcast feed whatever one you use spotify soundcloud uh apple podcast just make sure you're subscribed download the podcast helps us out a ton definitely and join the discord you know we got big plans for the discord this coming year so now's the time to get in get in absolutely. early <clears throat> discord is vibes absolutely right. now the first story in the NFL that I want to touch on. And, you know, you just talked about how a lot has happened in free agency, but I feel like the major dominoes have yet to fall. It's interesting. Like Lamar, Rogers, et cetera. Like the big, the true big stories of this free agency are still up in limbo. And we can start with Lamar Jackson. Mm -hmm. So last week, right, he tweets out a letter to his fans. Quote, as of March 2nd, I have, uh, I have requested a trade from the Ravens organization for which the Ravens have, have not been interested in meeting my value. Any and everyone that has met me or been around me knows that I love the game of football and my dream is to help a team win the Super Bowl. You're all great, but I had to make a business decision that was best for my family and I. So that comes from Lamar Jackson at the end of March. He's noting a request that he made at the very beginning of March, March 2nd. And he's tweeting this out moments before Harbaugh is going live at the owner's meeting about to talk to the press. I mean, first things first, we stand a petty king. Shout out to <laughs> Lamar for that. Love that. Love the pettiness of it all. But it's interesting to me, the timing that this was a request made at the beginning of March, and it's not really becoming public knowledge until the end of March and it seems to me like like we're playing some games. We're playing some PR games. We're trying to put the pressure on the Ravens organization to either, you know, concede to his demands and his needs or or just basically putting it out to the league, yo, come and get me because I'm I'm ready to be gotten. Yeah, and I think it's <clears throat> I think it's more so the latter. I think yes. that Lamar is ready to leave Baltimore. I don't think he has any ill will or bad blood towards Baltimore, but they just decided that he's not worth what he thinks he's worth and he wants out. And I think there are numerous teams that should be in the market for Lamar, even including, you know, the Patriots, my favorite team. Uh, but it's look, it's looking like that's not going to happen. And I'm just interested to see where this all shakes up and ultimately where he does land. I think as it stands right now, Vegas, in my opinion, is currently – thinking that he's going to be a Baltimore Raven. I know we're going to talk about win totals, but looking at the Ravens win total here on FanDuel, it's over eight and a half wins at minus 144. So Vegas has set the line that they think the Ravens are going to win, you know, about nine to 10 games. And if they're winning nine to 10 games, Lamar is the starting quarterback. Um, right. Because this line should be six and a half, five and a half potentially if anybody besides Lamar Jackson starts games for the Baltimore Ravens next year. Yeah, no, I mean, I totally agree with that. And it's interesting to see, <laughs> but to me, and, and we talked about this on the last podcast, it seems like that relationship is fractured. I, I hear what you're saying about them not having ill will, but at the same time, like Lamar 
has to feel disrespected at this point. Oh, absolutely. Right? Like, you know, and, and he has to look no further than his own division in the Cleveland Browns and what's happened there to just see like, why am I not getting a guaranteed contract like that? And and we've talked about this in our Discord channel. And it seems to me like the owners of the NFL are taking a stand against Lamar Jackson because there are probably 26, 25 teams that should be actively trying to get mm -hmm. Lamar Jackson. Like this deal should be done. The demand should be extremely high. If you're not the Bills, Bengals, you know, Chiefs, Chargers, Jags, like if you're not in these teams with solid quarterbacks, top tier quarterbacks, Lamar Jackson is more than likely improving your franchise immediately. So the yep. fact that this deal hasn't gotten done to me is more so about the league not wanting to set a standard that guaranteed contracts are a thing because right now it's really this Watson deal that is an anomaly. And if it starts becoming something that happens again and then happens again, at that point, it's just the standard. And because of Lamar Jackson and, you know, while he is, yes, 26 years old, former MVP, sky high ceiling, he seems like the perfect guy, unfortunately, for the owners to take a stand against with the rushing duality, the questions about him as ridiculous as they are, in my opinion, about him as a passer. I think he's great, but people can look at him and say, oh, he's just a dual threat quarterback, injury risk, yada, yada, yada. And for that reason, the owners have just seem seemingly taken a stand against him because this deal should have been done. Absolutely. And I mean, you, you laid it out perfectly. You said it, it's just the perfect storm. And that's kind of what we talked about in the discord uh, last week or whatever, when we were having this conversation and I was more so arguing that it wasn't really because of the Deshaun Watson deal. It's because Lamar was the perfect quarterback to do this against and for the owners to take a stand against, like you said, former MVP, but he's missed five plus games in each of the last two seasons. And then there's already concerns about, you know, long-term availability with, like running backs, right? Like we, we say running backs don't matter. And Lamar has the workload of a running back as well as the duties of a quarterback. Um, so there's definitely some inherent risk with Lamar there. And we have two major quarterbacks looking for major uh, extensions in Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow. And honestly, if it was one of those two guys and they were in this situation, this wouldn't even be happening. Yeah. So it's just an unfortunate fact that Lamar is the perfect quarterback for the NFL and the owners to do this against. Um, I think he's a great quarterback, but like I said, if this was Herbert or, Bur or Burrow, this wouldn't even be a conversation because they're going to get so much guaranteed money. It's not even crazy. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, just unfortunate that this is happening to Lamar, you know, obviously I feel bad for him. He he wants to get paid and I think he deserves to get paid. <laughs> That's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. It's that it, simple. It, it, I think he does though. Like I think when no, it's will. all said and done, he will get the contract and this will become the standard. So will Burrow, so will Herbert and so on and so forth. Trevor down the line, like whether or not they want to accept it yet. I think that Watson and, and that deal changed things one way yeah. or the other, especially because of the other cloud of things surrounding Watson. Every other quarterback can just look at it and be like, well, if you gave it to him with all of that included, you, you can't not give it to me. Right. Yeah. And, and that's going to, and for them, like, why would you bend on that? Why would you allow yourself to be broken on that? Like that, that's a pretty good stance to take in my opinion. And I think that the quarterbacks and the players eventually will win this. Yeah, no, I definitely agree, um, especially with other quarterbacks, like I said, looking for extensions here shortly. Uh, but I guess my my last question would be related to fantasy and best ball. Are you in on Lamar Jackson and just his overall team uncertainty right now? He has an ADP of about 54, 55 across both drafters and underdog fantasy in the QB6, QB7 range. Are you in an, Are you in on Lamar at that price? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm in on him. I mean, I think that we saw and we'll continue to see over the next handful of years that being able to be a separator at the quarterback position and having access to a ceiling that, you know, maybe only the top six, seven, eight quarterbacks in the league have is going to be increasingly important. And Lamar yeah. is one of those guys. And 
he's not really dependent necessarily on team situation. He does so much on his own. And I think that there's a good chance that he lands in a good spot, right? Like the, like we were talking and I was being, you know, a little facetious, you know, trolling you, but like, I think the Patriots are the only realistic team that would be a downgrade to his fantasy value. Colts, Lions, Falcons, like all of these are good spots, better spots than Baltimore in terms of surrounding talent. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm totally in on Lamar. I don't really see him landing in a spot that hurts his value. It seems like one of those things that inevitably wherever he signs ADP goes up when it happens. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, speaking of another quarterback situation Mm -hmm. and another running quarterback. Yeah. Let's talk about the most overdrafted quarterback in fantasy football. Mr. Trey Lance. Oh, boy. <clears throat> in my opinion, I think he is the most overdrafted quarterback in best ball currently in 2023. He's going as the QB 15, pick 115. Uh, I'm just out on Trey Lance. And I think the overall conversation that we should have is, what do you think is going to happen with the 49ers quarterback position? I think right now as it stands, Brock Purdy's probably the starter. Trey Lance is probably QB2. Sam Darnold is QB3. Uh, but there have been reports and rumblings that, you know, Sam Darnold could be in contention for the starting job, but it's Brock Purdy's job to lose. So what are your thoughts on the situation? And are you buying or selling Trey Lance slash Brock Purdy slash Sam Darnold? <laughs> well, it's tough because I don't really think, and we saw this, that even when the team is winning and Brock Purdy is performing well from an NFL standpoint, that there's really not much of a ceiling there from a fantasy perspective, which is tough because you want to be in on a team like the 49ers from like team stack, game stack type perspective because the offense is so high powered with so many great weapons. QB 15 is absolutely disgusting for Trey Lance. I mean, that's that's horrifying. I wouldn't touch him. That being said, looking at some updated ADP on underdog right now, and this is super flex, so it changes things a little bit, but not really so much in terms of like the order of players. Trey Lance has now fallen to QB 21 hmm. behind guys like Bryce Young, Kyler, Carr, Russ, Gino, Jared Goff, like all guys who he was going ahead of a week ago. So the market does seem to be scaling back a little bit. I think a lot of that is probably due to the quotes from John Lynch last week. He said, quote, I think Brock has probably earned the right to be the guy. If we were to line up, he'd probably take the first snap. And I take that at face value. I know that we always have to take things with a grain of salt when it comes to what the owners are saying, especially at this time of year. But from the team perspective, Brock Purdy came in and he was highly successful. So why wouldn't they give him the chance? You know, Trey Lance hasn't really shown much. And I know injuries have been a huge part of that. I think Trey clearly has higher upside. But when you miss so much time in your first two years, I think it's really hard for the team to want to recommit to you when they already have what in their eyes, at least, is a viable starter in Brock Purdy. So it's, it's a super messy situation. I could see Trey Lance getting traded, although with the way the 49ers quarterbacks have gotten hurt in recent years, I think they'd be wise to just keep him. You know, they more than probably any other team in the league appreciates the value of depth at the quarterback position. Absolutely. I mean, they have ran so bad on quarterback injuries over the last few years, but I do believe that Brock Purdy would be the, the week one starter. If the season started today, obviously, barring health, uh, we know that he tore the ligament in his elbow. So he obviously has some rehabbing to do. And Trey Lance is probably going to be healthier uh, at the start of the season than Brock Purdy. But even then, I mean, Brock Purdy came in and showed that he could at least manage the offense and not lose games, which I think is all Kyle Shanahan is looking for at this point. And then there's the added, added risk of Trey Lance with him just maybe not being good. You know, absolutely. Like, obviously, we're we're enamored by like his fantasy upside and his fantasy potential. And that kind of biases us and clouds our judgment a little bit as fantasy guys. Uh, But from a real life NFL perspective, he just may not be that good of a quarterback. And Kyle Shanahan would rather roll with Brock Purdy. Um, he, He showed that he can win games, like I said, over Trey Lance. So. I'm out on Trey Lance for fantasy purposes. In real life, I I still think that he deserves a chance. He's obviously had a very bad run out to start his career. 
Um, but I, but I think he could be a capable quarterback with upside. And honestly, if I'm the Niners, that's kind of what I'm prioritizing is getting the quarterback in that has a theoretical ceiling and upside. Just because I, I, I think you know what you're getting with Brock Purdy and or Sam Darnold at this point. You're getting, you know, um, game managing quarterback with an average ceiling at best, um, which is fine. That can win them games. But I, I still think that they should, you know, invest in Trey Lance and at least give him an opportunity. And I think at, at one point in this next season, he will have an opportunity, whether that be with the 49ers or not. Over under two and a half quarterbacks making starts for the 49ers in 2023. I mean, with how they've been running with quarterback <laughs> injuries, I mean, you got to take the over. But um, I, I think the Darnold stuff is all smoke. I mean, yeah. I think they brought him in and maybe that does spell some potential interest in shipping off Trey Lance. Like I just said, I don't think that they should trade Trey Lance personally. No. But that being said, if I'm a team like, say, I don't know, the Colts, Maybe I think that trying to get somebody like Lance, the Titans trying to get somebody like Lance, I think that would make a lot of sense. Like if I were another team, I would be making offers. If I'm the Niners, I'm like, nah, I'm good. But I, yeah. I think Lance is somebody that should be given a chance and there's upside there, untapped upside. So somebody yeah. should try and tap it. Pause. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's touch on, and, and we can keep, keep this super brief. I'm so ungodly sick of talking about this, but the Aaron Rodgers to New York Jets saga continues. It feels like less of a lock than it was the last time we talked about it. But I mean, what's the hold up here, dude? Is it just the compensation? Because he said he wants to play for them. They have built the offense to be ready for him to come in, right? They did ship off Elijah Moore, which we can talk about in a minute. They brought in Miko Hardman. They brought in his boy, Alan Lazard. The team is built. It's ready. They've served up the plate. They just need Rodgers to sit down and eat it. So come to town. Rodgers, stop making this a thing. Can we just get this done, please? Honestly, I think it's not even Rodgers. It's the Packers organization. They're just valuing Aaron Rodgers way more than the market. And they want I that mean, first. That's I mean, you, you look at the 2022 offseason and you see Russell Wilson get this massive haul. Um and the Packers are probably thinking like Aaron Rodgers is significantly better than Russ. Like we should be able to get a haul. But the, the fact of the matter is, is what he's 40 or pushing 40. Um, he's probably only got a few good years left and you're just not going to get the compensation for him that you want. And I think ultimately they will compromise and he will end up being a New York jet. Vegas obviously believes that Aaron Rodgers uh, to the Jets is pretty much a done deal at this point with their win total. And those are the only props for season long that you could bet right now are Aaron Rodgers props. Um, and, and then some Jets stuff to it. Like Garrett Wilson is the only receiver up on FanDuel currently. Mm -hmm. So I think Vegas is set in stone that Rodgers is a Jet. Obviously, everybody believes that he's a Jet as well. And I mean, he probably plays for New York this year, but honestly, would would we be, would we be surprised if somehow, some way, he ends up staying in Green Bay and, and playing in Green Bay for another year? I mean, we've we've had this conversation for the last three years that Rodgers is going to leave and and whatnot, and somehow, some way, they always find a way to work it out, and he stays. I, I would be surprised at this point. Yeah, um, I, I, I just too. think that he's totally worn out his welcome. I think that the Packers are sick of the back and forth bullshit, to be honest with you. Like, and, and we can even see it in the rhetoric coming from them that, you know, over the past few seasons when he's done, done this whole, like, will he, won't he thing, they've been like, we want him, you know, as soon as he's ready, come on home. Now they're just like, man, we're really excited to see what Jordan love can bring to the table. <laughs> like they're, they're over it. They are fully over it. So just get the deal done, man. The Jets have two second round picks. They don't want to give up the first. The Packers want the first. Take the two seconds. Take a second this year. Take a second next year. Do whatever you got to do to get it done, but get it done. Let's stop talking about it. Can't stand Aaron Rodgers. Jesus <laughs> Christ. All right. In other related news, like we just mentioned, the Jets shipped off Elijah Moore to Cleveland. And this is interesting, man. I think that this could be a very strong signing for mm -hmm. the Cleveland offense. Elijah Moore entering his third year, definitely coming off of a sophomore slump type of season. 
But that being said, while you look at Elijah Moore and his stats on the surface, they were disappointing 37 receptions, 446 yards and one touchdown last season. Not great, especially with the expectations we had for him coming in. But that being said, like the underlying metrics don't really fall off in any kind of extreme way. He went from averaging seven yards per target to 6.9. He went from averaging 12.5 yards per catch to 12.1, like slight downgrade. But you can attribute a lot of that, I think, to just the god awful quality of quarterback play. And Elijah Moore has talent. And he's entering an offense that has an availability in terms of target share, right? You've got Amari Cooper, who's a certified alpha DPJ. You know, he was the number two last year, but more of a role player, I would say than anything. And Joku is solid, but Elijah Moore, I think easily slides in and could very well be the wide receiver too, right off the bat. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. And I I think that he probably is for sure. And the, the Browns have a very good, offense and in terms of their skill position players i mean this is setting up to be you know one of their best if not their best offense over the last 20 years or so uh deshaun watson is finally going to have you know a full off season with the team and reps and training camps and otas and all of that stuff that you know goes into uh creating chemistry with your teammates, which he did not have last year. So personally, just talking about the Browns in general here, I'm pretty high on the Browns. I I, I think that you know this, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty high on Deshaun Watson. And I know that you're kind of in the middle, I would say. Uh, I don't, I don't want to say like you're low on them, but you're definitely not high on Watson as a fantasy asset at this current moment, but, but I definitely think he's a late round quarterback that you want to target. He's going around the QB eight QB 10 right now on underdog fantasy, just in the regular format, not super flex, um, you know, pick 85, 90 ish that range. And in my opinion, that's just the range of quarterback that you want to target. Uh, Watson does have an elite ceiling in my opinion. And obviously he was very bad last year. But you can attribute that to a lot of factors. You don't want to make excuses, but there are a ton of valid excuses, honestly, that show that maybe that was a little bit fluky. He comes in, he hasn't played football in two, three years, right? So that's number one. Number two, he had no reps with the team. He wasn't even with the team for the entire offseason or in season. He couldn't be. Three, he had multiple weather games, okay? Two out of the six games that he played were bad weather games. I don't know why you're shaking your head, because <laughs> they were. Go look at the games. Dude, they, when when did you get such an extended reach? That's that's That reach is crazy. It's not a reach. We're talking about weather games? You were about to lit off some bull, some list off some bullet points, and that weather is the third on the list? You were I mean, shooting this man bail. Weather, weather's definitely a concern, and the Browns had injuries as well on the offensive line. So now you're going to get, like I said, Watson with a full training camp, full offseason with the team, reps, film, et cetera, healthy offensive line, Weak division. I mean, I, I think that just looking at the Browns win total, it's nine and a half currently with juice to the under. I mean, I'm taking the over plus 114 on FanDuel. Uh, may, maybe you could find a better line um, on a different book, but that's just what I'm looking at. Plus 114 over nine and a half um, just for everything that I said. And then when you factor in that Lamar may be leaving the division and the Steelers obviously – Nobody's worried about the Steelers. Ravens would be dog water without Lamar. You're really only contending with Cincinnati at that point. And I think 10 wins is is very doable out of 17 games for this Browns team that overall on paper, they look very, very good. Yeah. And they have a pretty decent strength of schedule. They're playing a a third or third or fourth place schedule. I think third fourth third 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 i think i'm not sure yeah they finished with more wins than the ravens oh no they didn't no they didn't i don't know their schedule is good though you know they play the cardinals ram seahawks they go against that division they've got the broncos they play the whole afc south like they have a strong strength of schedule so from a win total perspective i could see it but the x factor and i mean you talked about it it's obviously 
Deshaun Watson. And, you know, to me, it's like, I don't think that there's a player with a wider range of outcomes in the NFL right now than Deshaun Watson. You mentioned how he had all of these factors going against him, and that is valid, no doubt about it. But it's like, is it a good excuse that he didn't play for two years? Like, do we give him a better outlook because he didn't play for two years and then he come back, he comes back and plays horribly in his first outing? Like, does that give you more confidence? I, I get what you're saying about having all this time, but for me, and and you've made the point, you know, when we talked privately about this and talked about this in Discord, that like there's no reason to think that physically and from a football perspective, he should have lost any type of skill set. And I agree with that. To me, the conversation is well beyond that. I think that, and, and, you know, maybe I'm reaching here in my own way, but I think that Deshaun Watson is somebody who has objectively gone through a very traumatic experience, right? He went from being somebody who was looked up to as like a role model and somebody who was like viewed in a very high regard to going for a long stretch of being like public enemy number one in the NFL and like even separating my own bias and my own perspective from that stuff. You look at how it has like shown itself in Watson's actions. And he seems like somebody to me who's in a hundred percent denial, right? So to me, denial shows that you're not accepting things as they are. And without that, how can you actually grow and start to like surpass those things that I think definitely played a, a factor in his play last year, because it's just as much mental as it is physical. So who knows? You know, that's getting into like thoughts about trauma and therapy, yeah, all, I mean, all this shit. You know, I mean, you I, know me though. It, like, but, you, yeah. you know me. I say that everything is more mental than physical, especially with football. Right. Coming, coming from somebody who has played, and even obviously, I, I still play a little bit flag, but it's obviously very different. But the quarterback position is is so much mental, like works. Like you have to be strong mentally. Uh, as well as physically. And that is really the argument. Um, and obviously we can't speak to his mental well-being. Of course. Um, you we can only speculate. And like you said, I do believe that physically he's one hundred percent fine. Right. He, he's, Agreed. He's in the prime of his life, right? He's a 26, 27 year old male at the top of his profession, getting paid millions and millions of dollars in the best shape of his life physically he's in his prime 100 percent. the question obviously is mentally how will this whole ordeal affect him moving forward and he could definitely uh, spiral out of control for sure and that could definitely affect his play and that's just something you really can't quantify mm -hmm. you can't measure that so especially from the outside yeah so that's the only hard part when discussing Watson from a fantasy perspective, but I guess I would kind of want to be on the optimistic side and say that, you know, the physical talent combined with the the work that he's probably doing off the field mentally, um, especially over the last year. I mean, I, I think it'd be pretty ignorant to say like he hasn't spoken to a therapist or something. Um, but who knows? Obviously we don't, but com combining everything, that I said just in terms of the, the factors and him having a full off season now um, with the fact that he's one of the most talented, he's one of the most physically talented quarterbacks in the entire NFL. Uh, I want to be optimistic on his outlook for 2023. And I'm pretty optimistic on the Browns outlook for 2023 as well. And that's just more so like, like you said, weak schedule, weak division and, now they're they're going to be fully healthy, and I think the Browns can compete for the division. The last point that I'll make is that I think if ever there were any credence, and, and I don't put anything into this, but you know that the powers that be have the ability to uh, influence the outcome of games, I think that there's probably 31 owners in the NFL who are tight with the Browns for this entire Watson contract. And going back to what we were just saying with Lamar and like, them not wanting this fully guaranteed contract to become the accepted standard. So I don't know, you know, maybe they're putting the call in, maybe, maybe yeah, some, some money is coming in to swing these things against the Browns and teach them a lesson. From yeah. The but I'll Browns. push, I mean, we we've had this conversation, so if you're not already, <laughs> make sure you join the discord, but I'll push back on that here. 
the the owners don't give a fuck. Like they only care about making money. They don't care about what. Well, this is a money conversation. Other, other teams are doing or whatever they're giving players. Obviously, it affects the market and deals like that uh, can inflate the market. But it'll always regress back, like hmm. for sure. Um, maybe maybe not in the next two years because we've already talked about Joe Burrow. Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, they're all going to get massive deals. But just looking at some of the contracts prior to Deshaun Watson, I mean, Kyler Murray got a fuck ton of guaranteed money. That deal looks horrendous right now. And I think I prior to that, like I thought Deshaun Watson deserved more than Kyler Murray. Aaron Rodgers got a fuck ton of guaranteed money. Um, trying to think of what other quarterbacks got big extensions. Um, I mean, Mahomes, but that's different. Mahomes, different. And Josh, Josh Allen got a ton of money and he was kind of more raw than some of the other quarterbacks. Like he, he had proven himself, but he had one year of mm -hmm. productivity um, prior to his extension, right? All these quarterbacks were getting bags. So the, the Watson contract, obviously the biggest in NFL history, but that's kind of the way it was headed either way, uh, regardless if Deshaun Watson got that contract or not. Like Russell Wilson got a ton of guaranteed money like it's just headed that way because it's it's the fully guaranteed that changes things though isn't yeah. it you know yeah. the fact that the entire contract was guaranteed that's what they're i i think that other owners ha would have an issue with not necessarily the money itself but just the fact that they have to do this and then you know like this could go down as one of the worst contracts in history if watson doesn't return to form and they gave him all of this guaranteed money i mean they're stuck like they're that they, they would be like a decade long setback for the franchise because you really can't get out from under that kind of thing yeah that's a that's a very fair point and um i i agree but i mean maybe watson wasn't the best player to do that but i think i think <laughs> quarterbacks say. i think quarterbacks should have fully guaranteed contracts like agreed like if watson obviously didn't have the off the field issues like that was obviously the way it was headed either way if that never happened, it'd be a good contract and nobody would bat an eye. But just because that happened, everybody's like, that's the worst contract in NFL history. Good conversation there. We hit on the three big quarterback stories in the league right now. Let's transition to some win total talk. Okay. And I mean, we could do a whole podcast on win totals, but they dropped across the sports books. Some of them stand out to me more than others. And I'm going to give out one here that I think is some nice juicy value. And that is the Jacksonville Jaguars at 10 and a half over, over plus money to plus 115. And to me, this is an absolute smash. I mean, what is a bigger lock right now in the league than Trevor Lawrence ascending in this third year? Like everything is setting up perfectly for it. The Jags play in a horrible division right? Texans, Colts, Titans, all bottom tier teams. The Jags have an ascending quarterback who showed that he's progressing last year. They get more weapons. You know, they keep their core, you know, Engram extended. Kirk is there. Zay Jones was a, you know, just, I mean, he showed out to be more than anything that we thought he would be. And now you're getting Calvin Ridley. And by the way, Calvin Ridley is going to be rocking number zero going forward, which is just That's absolutely saucy. cold, ice cold. I love it. I love it. Um, so you look at the Jags and the teams that they're playing this year. We already said they play their own division. That could uh -huh. easily be 6-0. Maybe they fumble one of those bags, and that's five. Probably. Wins. They also play the NFC South, arguably the other worst division in football. Tampa, absolutely. Carolina, Atlanta, and New Orleans. The cherry on top, the other division they play. AFC North. So yeah, Bengals are tough. Browns could definitely be tough. Like we just said, that could go either way. Steelers, nobody's worried. Ravens, most likely without Lamar, nobody's worried. I think it sets up really well just for the natural trajectory that the Jags are taking as an ascending team. And I believe in that. And then paired with the fact that they get to play basically the two worst divisions in football, <laughs> it's yeah. a stone lock. And I mean... <laughs> They have, they have some tough one-offs. Don't get me wrong. They do play Buffalo. They do play San Francisco and they do play KC. That's, that's probably three L's. I mean, it could be, but like the thing is, is if they take this next step or if they take this next step and Trevor like really ascends the way that we think he can, they're live to win one of those games easily, you know? Yeah. And, and really that's okay. all it takes. So I think that they get 10 wins just based off 
of their division, the AFC North, the NFC South, if they can scrape by one win against the Bills, Chiefs, or Niners, lock it up. And at plus money, I mean, you should put the house on it. Yeah, and um, I, I will say you can get nine and a half at minus 130 on FanDuel. So you, you could okay. go the nine and a half route, eat a little bit of juice there. Uh, but I do like the over 10 and a half. I think they could win 11 of their 17 games just with everything you said, opponents, um, ascension. And that's really the thing with me and why I believe in a Trevor Lawrence ascension is we've seen it over the last few years and we've talked about it. What happens when you add, you know, an elite wide receiver one to an offense or at least a, a top, a top talent at the wide receiver position? Yeah, um, it's the blueprint. <laughs> it's the blueprint to having your quarterback ascend into another tier of quarterback. Mm-hmm. And they get Calvin Ridley, and he's already come came out and stated like he's going for 1,400 plus yards. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, Ridley's on a mission. Yeah, and he, and Ridley, Ridley is him. I know that it's been a minute and we may forget. He's good. But, but he's Ridley good. is definitely him. And, I mean, shout out to whoever that was on Twitter with the take that Calvin Ridley is going to be the number two to Christian Kirk. I mean, you're absolutely chalked. <laughs> Christian Kirk is good and all, but Calvin Ridley is is legitimately him. He is a wide receiver one. Yeah, I mean, Christian Kirk is obviously very good. And I think it would be kind of like a more 1A, 1B situation. Uh, but with Kirk being like a distant one B there. Yeah. Um very distant. But miles the, away. But yeah, the, the Jags are definitely an ascending team and they obviously have a full NFL draft uh to hit on more players. And I, I do love that win total. Like I said, you can get it at nine and a half on FanDuel or ten and a half at plus money. Uh, I think both would be bets there. My favorite win total for twenty twenty three is an under. You know me. I gotta. I gotta rock the unders. Um, mm. Patriots. I, I just <laughs> <laughs> shut the fuck up. All right. My favorite under is going to the NFC South. Uh, you referenced that division. I will take the Carolina Panthers under seven and a half wins. Okay. I know. You just said the division is trash, and the division is kind of up for air, but I think this is just a game too high. I think they should be at like six and a half. Now, Vegas has them at minus 142 to go over seven and a half. So kind of going off the wall here a little bit, taking the under at plus money. I just don't think this team is that good. I know they signed Miles Sanders. They signed DJ Chark and Adam Thielen and Hayden Hurst. I don't think any of these guys move the needle, in my opinion. They're going to have a rookie quarterback come in as well into, obviously, a poor division. But I still think that, division-wise, they'll they'll have some tough games. Like, they'll have tough games against the Saints. The Bucks and Panthers always play close. The uh, Panthers and um, and. Falcons the Panthers and Falcons always play close as well and honestly I think the the Falcons are a better team than the Panthers currently um so just with that being said I'm going to take the under and just bet against a rookie quarterback especially if that quarterback is like Anthony Richardson I mean that would be just a great bet if he ends up being the day one starter uh because I think he is more of a project than Bryce Young and CJ Stroud, but we'll have to see who they take at number one. Um, my money would would probably be CJ Stroud right now, but we'll see about that. It's just betting against a rookie quarterback, and I'll take that bet ten out of ten. I, I absolutely love that. I really do. Um, at plus money, like that. That's the only reason I'm taking it. If the under was ju- was used to, um, if the under was juiced, I would I would just stay away. But yeah, it's, I it's plus I, I like sixteen. It. I like it a ton, man. I mean, I, I feel like seven and a half might be like two wins too high for Carolina. I yeah. get it within the context of the division and it, it makes they sense. also play, like I said, they play the, a, a weak division in the AFC South. So they could scrape some wins off against the Colts and, and Titans who are also justifiably terrible, but, but like Titans and say the, the Titans and Panthers play Titans win that game. Yeah. Mostly. Like, yeah. I, I totally agree with that. And like Mike Rabel is still a good coach. He's going to have the Titans competitive, even though they suck. Yeah, and, and we we also see this happen. Like we just talked about the blueprint for ascending quarterbacks is is getting them weapons. And when we say that, we're talking about 
Stephon Diggs to Josh Allen. We're talking about Jamar Chase to Joe Burrow. We're talking about Calvin Ridley to Trevor Lawrence. AJ We're not Brown. talking about DJ Chark, Adam Thielen, and fucking Hayden Hurst for $51 million. Like, what are you doing? What are like you they're, doing? They're solid, the but they're they're not move need or needle movers. Yeah. They're they're like to me, like the, the corollary I draw is what happened last year in Jacksonville, who was completely devoid of talent, and they brought in Christian Kirk, Evan Ingram, and Zay Jones, right? Like that's that's solid, right? But they aren't needle movers, and the Jags will eventually, as we'll see, I think, need more to truly ascend. Yeah. They're not needle movers. They're not. It's good depth, and it's better than what it was looking like when Terrace Marshall was the only wide receiver with a pulse on the team. And but, that's them with an ascending quarterback in Trevor Lawrence as well. Yes, like, that's the Panthers will definitely, definitely a be a year or two away. I think from being competitive, they they yeah. would be my pick to finish last in this division. And I don't think that last place in this division is going to have eight wins. I think they're they probably going to have like four. Prediction: Clip this April third. I think the Panthers go six and eleven. Okay. That sounds fair to me. That sounds totally fair to me. Yeah. Let's talk about some other NFL free agency news to close things out here. We just mentioned DJ Chark to Carolina and the lions replace him with a a familiar face. And and my guy, (laughs) Marvin Jones, welcome back to the pride. My guy, how we doing? (laughs) I don't think it's a bad pickup. I think Marvin Jones could be just a solid NFL wide receiver three. Um, yeah, he, he, he's good depth. I mean, and, yeah. and and that's perfect because they're not really filling a necessary need. They're just adding depth. They've got a Monra. They've got the ascension, hopefully, of Jamison Williams coming. And then even ancillary guys like Waleef and, and Josh Reynolds, that's all well and fine. And Marvin Jones is just another another body like that. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm down with the signing. They gave him like, what, like three, four million. It, it's whatever. It's a good depth signing. I, I, good depth. I imagine him more so being a guy that is annoying for us, <laughs> like a guy who is we're never betting on, you know, we're on a Monra yeah. and it's like, dude, why does Marvin Jones have five catches right now? This is chalked. Yeah. I mean, there, there will be a couple games like that for sure. Uh, maybe like, yeah, two or three throughout the season, but he should, he should be a non-factor to be honest. Um, he'll, he'll just be like a solid real life NFL wide receiver, but we're never playing him in DFS or betting on him for props. Maybe unless, unless you want to bet his anytime touchdown, uh, but obviously it's still early injuries can happen and who knows Marvin Jones might be a, a chalk player come week five wouldn't be surprised <laughs> in the least all right this one sneaky impactful Joey Damian Harris your boy leaves New England stays in the division Pain. goes to Buffalo Devin Singletary gone we'll talk about that next but Damian Harris James Cook that's a super Super solid 1A, 1B. I think Damian Harris could make a big impact this season. Yeah, I mean, I think Damian Harris could have, you know, at at the high end of his range, uh, Jamal Williams-esque season. Yes, exactly. Where he's scoring 15-plus touchdowns. I mean, he already did that with the Patriots. Mm-hmm. You no, know, not last year, the year before. He was Jamal he's, before Jamal. Yeah, he he had 15 touchdowns with New England. Now he goes to obviously a more explosive offense in Buffalo uh, with minimal competition for carries. You have James Cook, who I think they kind of just want to use more as a change of pace back. I don't think he's ever going to be a workhorse like his brother, for example. And then you have a competition with Josh Allen on the ground. But I think, and, and this is just a complete hunch, I think that the Bills kind of want to start limiting Josh Allen's carries a, a little bit. He he ended up he ended up getting banged up a little bit last year. And I think moving forward as he gets older, he's going to have to start running a little bit less. Maybe it's not this year, but I, I think we could see them tone it down just just a little bit. They they don't want his trajectory to go the Cam Newton route. Yeah, exactly. Um so I, I think they just want to have Josh Allen take less abuse. Um, especially on the ground, but it's still Josh Allen. He's going to run the ball and, and score touchdowns. So that's competition there. But I, I think this is one of the best spots for Damian Harris uh, that, that we could have hoped for. And he's definitely a target as a late round running back in, in fantasy. I th- he's going in like round 10, around the Rashad pennies of the world, et cetera. And I, I think that's pretty fair. And he has double digit touchdown upside. Like if he stays healthy, he's scoring 10 plus rushing touchdowns. 
Yeah, I feel like he is like the player that's best prototypically built specifically for underdog best ball. Yeah, because literally. he's probably going to be very inconsistent. He's going to have a few essentially nothing in the passing game, and he'll probably have more than three two touchdown 20. games. Yeah, he'll have know? like three or four 20 point games over yep. the course of a 17 game season. Bar floor, injury. high ceiling. Yep, I, I totally agree. And then. In a corollary move, Devin Singletary now shipped off to the Houston Texans, who made a flurry of moves since the last time we recorded. They added Dalton Schultz to the roster, which I like. They added Robert Woods, which, I mean, that does absolutely nothing for me. And they shipped off Brandon Cooks, which we can talk about in a minute. Devin Singletary and Damian Pierce, how do you see this backfield working out? I think we probably both agree that Pierce is a more talented player but that being said Devin Singletary he's not flashy but he's been productive he's always stayed productive I, I mean it's not I, I don't really know how I feel about this this split here I, I'm not, not too, a Singletary guy I'm not yeah I'm, I've never been a Singletary guy I mean he was pretty good last year with opportunity and I definitely think that there's opportunity available as it stands right now Damian Pierce in my opinion is the clear-cut RB1 but this new resume has no ties to Damian Pierce. And honestly, I think that they draft a running back. So this mm. is a conversation for after the draft. And when we have our post-draft pod, a lot's going to change about how we value certain players uh, with the additions that these teams are going to make in the next month. And I, I think that Houston is very live to draft a rookie running back in what is considered by many to be kind of a deeper running back class a little bit. Mm. Um, so not too high on any of these Texans guys. I mean, they're, they're still so far away from being relevant. I think they're on the right track just with the coaching hires that they've made and some of the players that they added, like you said, Schultz, uh, Woods, they get rid of Cooks, a, a player that just didn't want to be there. Like, you can't have those guys in the locker room. Or speaking of Brandon Cooks, you could talk about Dallas Cowboys. Mm -hmm. They add Brandon Cooks, what, like a fifth-round pick, pretty cheap. They sign Ronald Jones. They release Zeke. We all saw that coming. Uh, so, so it looks like, as it stands right now, they're they're going to run a three wide receiver set of C.D. Lamb, Brandon Cooks, Michael Gallup, with Tony Pollard as the one A, and and Ronald Jones as probably a distant second. Um, how do you feel about the Cowboys this year? Cowboys are a tough one for me to diagnose. Um. I was in on them very heavy last year. It didn't really work out. I mean, they're so, like Dak is surrounded by talent. Um, Brandon Cooks is gone for, I mean, we, we've talked so much about like all of his thousand yard seasons. He's had a thousand yards on four different NFL franchises at this point. I, I kind of think that the list has, has run out. I don't foresee Brandon Cooks having a thousand yard season in Dallas. I mean, in theory, it's a toss up between him and Michael Gallup. I mean, Michael Gallup fell off hard last year, but like, Gallup is a guy who we really liked. Maybe the injuries just caught up from him and he's not going to regain that same speed that he had prior. But I think Cooks fits in best here as a wide receiver three and, and an ancillary option. I mean, they probably are hoping for something out of Jalen Tolbert this year. They spent a second round pick on him last year. I mean, he just barely touched the field. Yeah, I mean, so that might be chalked and maybe... You know, at first I was like, wow, they're bringing in Brandon Cooks. Is that like a knock on Gallup? But I think it probably speaks more to Tolbert than anything else. And just the fact that they're not anticipating yeah. him making a big impact. Um, Dallas, definitely a playoff team, just like them as a whole. More so because of their defense is loaded and they're in the NFC. So it doesn't take much to be a, a playoff team in the NFC. So they'll yeah. probably make the playoffs. They'll probably get chalked in the first two rounds per usual. And it'll just be another standard season in dallas <laughs> with rojo i'm not doing it again bro i'm not doing yeah, it again no. i did it last year don't know why i did it i shouldn't have done it and i'm not gonna do it again we learned from our mistakes chalking it yeah no rojo I mean, for me you got you got to chalk rojo for sure i mean i i would expect dallas to add in another running back at some point as well just no on Rojo. Agree with just the overall take on the on the Cowboys in general. They'll 100% be a playoff team. Uh, their win total currently is nine and a half. Are you taking the over on that? Minus 134 to the over, nine and a half. I don't know, man. I think I'm, I might lean under. I mean, 
they're gonna lose to the Lions. They're gonna <laughs> lose to the Bills, to the 49ers. I don't know. They got the Chargers. They got a tough schedule. I don't know. I think I think I'm leaning under on on Dallas. That's but crazy. I don't know, man. They they they're gonna be in that range. Like they'll be yeah. between nine and eleven wins. Like no lower, no more. Yeah, definitely. Um, I I agree. I think from a fantasy perspective, Cooks is going to be like a solid wide receiver three. Definitely a good shot in best ball. Uh, Michael Gallup, he was coming off of a torn ACL. And in general, if anybody cares, like you kind of want to just fade players their first year back from a torn ACL. It's been a profitable strategy, especially at the wide receiver position. Um, and, and we've seen it a bunch over the last few years. Like receivers just aren't productive coming off torn ACLs. You had, you know, OBJ, Michael Gallup, Cortland Sutton, just to name a few guys that were just inconsistent options the year after an ACL. And I, I know I'm missing a ton, but it's just overall profitable. And I wasn't in on Michael Gallup last year, but I think I'd be in on Michael Gallup this year if his ADP is discounted because of this Brandon Cooks move. Yeah, Gallup going right now on underdog as the wide receiver 71. That screams by to me. Yeah, Mm -hmm. especially as part of Dax Dax for sure. Yeah, no, I like that call quite a bit. And and Gallup, I mean, we're what, like two years removed from looking at him and Amari Cooper as a 1A, 1B, like they had identical stats, essentially the year that Coop, like Cooper's last year before going to Cleveland, like Gallup was legit good. So I, I would, I would be uh, in as well on a Gallup bounce back. Let's close out here with a couple of tight end stories. Most of these guys probably not going to be huge impacts. I think the one that is quietly impactful, especially for fantasy is Irv Smith going to the Cincinnati Bengals, filling the whole left as Hayden Hurst went to Carolina. And we saw Hayden Hurst be highly productive in fantasy. You know, we were betting his receptions frequently. You know, he was always at three and a half and he was always popping out four for you. And he got touchdowns. He was used a lot. He's obviously entering a very high powered offense. They utilized Hurst. I think it's a really good spot. And, and it makes sense for Irv Smith, obviously, the Vikings brought in Hawkinson, so they, they didn't need him anymore. And Irv is a talented guy. You know, another guy like you just mentioned coming off of injury last year, but he we, we were bullish on him prior to that. So I, I, I like Irv Smith. I think it's a great landing spot. And what we want in these tight ends more than anything else is the ability to score touchdowns. And that comes by being in a good offense. And he's in one of the best. Yep. I mean, a uh, great real life signing for Cincinnati. I mean, you get a cheap upside tight end in Irv Smith for what, like $3 million. I mean, you couldn't ask for much more, especially after Hurst leaves and, you know, gets a decent contract from Carolina. So from a real life perspective, great move from a fantasy perspective. It's just always been about availability with Irv. He just hasn't been able to stay healthy throughout his career. We know that can be a little bit fluky, so as it stands right now, I'd be in on Irv Smith. He's going as what? Probably the tight end 25 or tight end 30 on underdog. Uh, I don't have it up, but that's where I would assume he's going. And I mean, at that price, you, you got to be in on Irv Smith for sure. I mean, tight end 27 is an absolute smash. Yeah. I knew he was somewhere in that range. Yeah, that's wild to me. I mean, I would totally take him there. And, and I'm sure, I, I guarantee it, Joey, there will be a week this year. 3,100, 3,200 on DraftKings. We're jamming him in every. I mean, not even week one, bro. If he's oh. if he's healthy going into the season at 2,700. Cash game lock. You heard it here first <laughs> on April 3rd. <laughs> the other two signings at tight end uh, that were uh, at least of note, just from a name perspective, were for the Raiders. They obviously shipped off Darren Waller to the Giants, and they brought in Austin Hooper and OJ Howard. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I don't have any thoughts. <laughs> like <laughs> these are two. I mean, they're they're two like average to below average NFL tight ends. They'll obviously be able to go out there and catch some passes. I mean, <laughs> wow, sound a little more unenthusiastic about it. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll they'll be able to go. They'll be able to go out there and and block a little bit and, and catch some balls, but. From a fantasy perspective, 
Obviously, there's no upside here, in my opinion. OJ Howard's not going to be Jimmy G's new Gron- uh, Gronk or or, George K- or Kittle. Kittle. I mean, even even with Jimmy G, like Kittle was super inconsistent. Yeah. So like, you you take away an elite tight end and and Darren Waller from the offense, and you you plug in two average tight ends that have no ceiling, no upside with a quarterback that has limited upside with some good target com- competition and Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers, and then Josh Jacobs coming off of, you know, one of the better running back seasons over the last five years. Um, just, just a long shot, obviously, but these dudes are probably priced tight end 30 and below both of them. And I, I think that's probably right. Yeah, man, real, real bummer situation here. We kind of thought that, Foster Moreau would sort of ascend because he was a pretty, you know, he was a guy who showed some upside in the times where Darren Waller was absent for the Raiders. So they bring in these guys and Foster Moreau's like, all right, I'm going to go work out for some other teams. He goes to New Orleans and during Mm -hmm. his physical is diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. They find out that he has cancer during his workout for a new team. And I I mean, that's just, that's, that's a really sad story. And And I think that you know, from his perspective, he kind of phrased it like, I mean, that like saved his life. Like he wouldn't yeah. have known about this had it not been for this, this workout with the Saints. It's a blessing in disguise because like he was going to get signed by an NFL team. He's an NFL caliber tight end for sure. So the Raiders essentially not, you know, extending Foster Moreau did potentially save his life. Um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, obviously I'm not too sure about like that whole cancer thing but it probably you know it's going to take a toll on him for sure and he's not going to play in the nfl this year but i just hope he's uh good and he gets back he gets back to playing football next year and i definitely think that he he could be an upside like fantasy tight end he has shown on the raiders that he does have some big games in his range of outcomes so i was excited uh, for Foster Moreau as a sleeper tight end this year, as you know, I'm the I'm the tight end guy of the pod. Uh, mm-hmm. Love me, love me some tight ends. Pause. I'm just gonna leave that alone. <laughs> pause, pause, pause. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I just hope he's good at the end of the day. I re- I really do. I just hope he's good. I do, I do as well. Um, you know, I I have a interesting relationship with with you know, cancer as a whole and people. Yeah. So I, uh, I feel for him deeply and, and wishing the absolute best for him. I don't want to, I'm not making light of this. This is a totally separate thought, right? This, but this just came into my mind, like after reading the story, because like this happens, right? What would you do? Like walk me through your thought process. How would you react if you went into a standard doctor's appointment and found out that you had like a year left to live again, this is away from Foster Monroe. This isn't what happened with him. He's most likely going to make a good recovery and shout out to him. But like, paint me the picture. You go into a doctor's office, you know, you're just getting your standard checkup and they're like, look, Joey, we have some bad news for you. Um, This is your final 365 on earth. Yeah. So I thought about this and I think the first thing I would do is obviously you you tell the people that you're closest with and you, you let them know what's going on. All right. Then since I'm not rich or anything, I'm getting as many credit cards, as many personal <laughs> loans as possible. I'm getting as much money to my disposable as possible, right? I'm not going to have to pay it. I'm not going to have to pay it back. So fuck it. Mm-hmm. I'm getting as much money as possible. And I'm going to just like travel a little bit, do the things that I want to do and just ultimately experience things that I probably would have never done prior. Um, so a bunch of drugs, bunch yep. of traveling, et cetera, et cetera. A uh, bunch of good food that I've never had. Just try a bunch of new new shit. Try and live my life to the fullest. I feel like that's a pretty standard answer. But I think this is where the curveball comes in. On like the last day or two, like if I like just say this is the exact date that you're going to die, like April 5th, like mm-hmm. today, I'm going out and I'm getting in a high speed chase. <laughs> That's so you're go you're going full OJ. Yeah, but like obviously well, half I would, OJ I would, minus the murder, but yeah, pro yeah. The, I'm not going to kill the, anybody. Uh, yeah, okay, interesting. And you know what? This totally checks out with everything I know about you because you're an absolute savage behind the wheel. 
I, I, I get this as something that you would like like to experience. I mean, I've thought life. about it. I've thought about it. Like how because you see it online and you see police chases. That shit looks fun as fuck. And I feel like I'd be able to get away. So that's kind of why I would want to do it. But obviously, I'm not going to do it now because I go to jail. But if I had how, nothing to live for, like. How long do you think that you could extend the chase for? Like, do you think they're getting you quickly or no, are you going to be making no. maneuvers? Bro, I just because people are stupid, man. Like, I'd be questioning their decisions when they're getting chased. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, like, why are you driving into oncoming traffic? And a lot of these cars that these people steal and get in police chases with, like, they don't have GPS or nothing. Like, I got Apple CarPlay in my in my car. I'm gonna have the maps up and see where I'm going. Like, I feel like that's the minimum, and nobody does that. You're gonna be bugging. bumping some Drake while, while you do it as oh, well. Oh, bro, I'm bumping. <laughs> windows down music blast and i'm driving 120 oh my god dude that is that's so funny that's such a good answer that's such a good answer what would you do all right so check it out i I thought about it i mapped it out here's here's the blueprint if i find out i've got a year left to live the first thing i thought about similar to you with the credit cards i thought about money right yeah like however much money you have i feel like when you get this diagnosis is like how much money you have because you you don't want to spend your last days working right so you're probably not going to be earning oh, too yeah. much money so the first thing i'm doing on day 1 this is an easy call i'm taking 25% of my net worth and i'm slamming it on a six leg prize pick super nuke <laughs> okay what if it doesn't hit <laughs> That see here's here's the thought process. You've got twelve months to live. If I lose twenty five percent of my net, that doesn't really I don't think change the quality of life that I can expect over twelve months. You know, let's say we're talking about like twenty thousand dollars. If I lose on a on a five k six legger, I've got fifteen left. What's the difference between you know twenty and fifteen? But fair enough. If you hit. That's 125 bands right in the bank account. And now you're talking about a huge change in your quality of life from 20 to like 140. So I think this is an all win, no lose scenario. So we're super nuking a six legger on prize picks day one. And then we're going from there. And not to mention, God already did me dirty with giving me a year left to live. So karma's got to come back around like that six legger's hitting. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I would travel for sure. Like you said, you know, I want to experience some things I haven't done, like stuff outside of the U S especially like, you know, places that are totally different. I'd love to like, see like Japan, like cultures that are nothing like ours and stuff like that. And then I would just, you know, do a few things that I wanted to get done. Like I would definitely go on a revenge tour, a hundred percent, my enemies, my ops, maybe a couple of my exes vengeance for all the wrongs that I've suffered. So you're just going to go on a murder spree? No, 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 no. Nothing violent, nothing crazy, nothing psycho. But petty, absolutely. I'll be remembered. No no need to worry about burning bridges when I won't be around to cross them. That's a bar. Fair enough. I would I would shoot my shot with a few girls in my life that I never, I never have before. Like, if you're down to your last days, you don't have to weigh the positives and negatives of potentially, like, ruining a friendship with somebody or, or something like that. So if I'm not alive anymore, I'm shooting that shot. Why not? Right? Fuck it. And then, you know, of course, the boring stuff, friends, family, bull, bull, all, all that bullshit. And, and lastly, the last thing I would do is I would be hitting you up all the time to try and pod. Because if you think about it, like one of us dies right now. This is kind of like the legacy that we're leaving behind, especially stuff like Dose of Life, where we like are getting our real thoughts sort of outside of just like reacting to football news. I would want to leave a decent bit of of that behind as well, yeah. artistically and creatively. So pod, uh, shooting my shot, revenge tour, and travel. I mean, this sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, like, definitely would have to pod, but, like, I don't, I don't know if I would, if, I don't know if I would want to do that if I had a year left, personally. I wouldn't want I think I probably would lose interest in potting about sports and yeah, football. Okay. You know, but I would I would like like dose of life, like that kind of stuff, I would still be interested in, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, I agree. So that was fun. That was funny. That, that was fun. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. That's gonna be it for this off season update. If you guys are interested with connecting us, uh fuck. 
All right, that's going to be it for this off-season update. If you guys are interested in connecting with us on a deeper level, you can follow us on Twitter at Dose Media Net, as well as our personal Twitters. I'm at Ben Hover. Joey's at Joey Carrion DFS. And if you would like to join our inner circle, you can find the link to our Discord chat in the show notes to this podcast. We will be back soon enough with win total talk, future talk. We'll be getting into draft conversations, best ball, and all of that over the coming weeks and months to everybody listening out there we appreciate you we value you until next time let's stay accountable and keep it authentic vibes